first of all, we've just been starting these conversations just with a quick, uh, how are you all and your family families doing? Uh, Luke, how about you? We're doing well. My, my wife is a community college teacher, and uh, between the two of us, we're both trying to work from home, uh, and we have a nine-year-old and a two-year-old. So the nine-year-old is doing fourth grade from home, and the two-year-old doesn't have any other child care coming here. Uh, so we're doing a lot of tag teaming these days, but we're enjoying family time together. That's, that's great. That's great. Jim, how about you? How are you doing? Well, you can guess my family's a little bit older, but I have two of my kids still living with us at home. But we've had an interesting three weeks. My wife, Mary, um, did come down with a virus that finally got her tested, and it was a seven-day wait between the test and the, and the thing. And so I was quarantined for those seven days. It came back negative, um, but it was still one of those viruses that came around. If you're going to get that sick, you ought to have COVID, you know, but <laughs> she didn't, um, thank goodness. And so I was able to go back and be at the shelter and be in the work we're doing. Wow, wow. And then just, <clears throat> just how, about, how about emotionally, given all the disruption that we're all experiencing right now, how are you guys... What are you doing to kind of manage that and and you know keep a schedule going? How, how's that? How's that for you all? I'll start off. I'm I'm able to go into the office every day, so that's something that I couldn't do before, and that's important to get up and get dressed, do what you do, go to the office, do what you're happening here. But I found, spend a lot more time not just with my own emotions, but dealing with the emotions of both clients and staff, because they are really high right now. And when you're in a frontline service organization, yeah. um, it can be really, you know, challenging. I'll bet. Yeah. Thank you. Luke, how about you? You know, in, in this season, um, so much of my ministry with my parishioners has shifted to, you know, online uh, interactions or the things that we're doing through Facebook and whatnot. Uh, and then making a lot of phone calls. And um, so I'm finding that uh, moments to preserve my spiritual and emotional health often involve uh, spending less time looking at screens <laughs> and uh, trying to take walks in the neighborhood or uh, enjoy reading a book with my daughters, things like that. Those are uh, key ways of pulling pulling out. There's no real day off, even though some people might think that us pastors are just getting vacation right now, but we're not. <laughs> yeah, when I was when I was first ordained, there was a, a, a smart aleck at the golf course that said, you know, it'd be great. It, it, you know, he says, you pastors, you know, you guys, you guys don't have to do anything except for work one day a week. And I said, you know, you're right. If you were as smart as me, you'd be working one day a week, too. <laughs> and uh, we, we really had a great laugh about that. But of course, that's not true. You know, part of it is the the emotional uh, work that we do to, in caring for people and loving folk, and whether whether we're doing a nonprofit or are being a pastor. I mean, there's a part of that work that just carries with you, you know, all the time. So, I, I really respect the work you two are doing, and I just would like to kind of step into this COVID nineteen thing a little bit here, Jim, and just ask, uh, what are you all trying to do practically to counter uh, the, the current virus at the shelter? Well, what I need to tell you is learn is the first thing we have to do because everything has changed from the time we started this process till now. We're learning as we go along. Yeah. Um, you know, the big issue has to do with if you're trying in a situation where you've got a, a population that um, you want to keep them all separate, you want to keep them all safe distance and everything else. But we're living in an old convent, folks. I mean, we'll have up to five people in a small dorm room. Wow. Um, and so that's a family that's fitting in there. What I can say that we've done to try and bring in some things that are going to help with that process. First step was let's make sure that we clean as we come in and clean as we go out. So every doorway has a hand sanitizer at it. Um, be lined to the sink to wash your hands because we don't want to bring in stuff from the outside. Right. Um, and so that's the first step. And then the same thing on the way out too is, is cleaning on the way out. Um, it's interesting to watch the kids all line up before each meal at the sink that's in the dining room where they have to wash their hands for 20 seconds in order to get ready to sit down to eat. Um, every room has a bucket full of bleach water in it where sanitizing happens after everything that we do there's a sanitizing coming through to to clean off the hard surfaces to make sure those things are clean things like doorknobs you know um handrails all those kinds of things have to be cleaned because the second somebody comes down with this it could be spread throughout the place um 
what we've also done at the same time is that I, I heard early that the way that China succeeded was to identify who was sick immediately and isolate them. Mm -hmm. And so we've set up and we got the, the, the church that we share, the, the, whose facility we use right now, um, Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church in Everett, um, has a part of the building that we're in that they use for evening programs. Well, as you know, evening programs aren't happening right now, in person anyway. And so we have set up in there and we asked them if can we use this part of the shelter for the next three months um, while we look at what's going on. And so what we have prepared there right now is two rooms. The large chapel has been made into our room for quarantine. That's for people, anybody who we find out gets gets contaminated with a known user or known coronavirus, they go into quarantine. And we feed them there and we keep them there. And it could be a whole family, it could be a part of a family, but right next to it also in a separate part of that same building is an isolation place where folks who would get the, the who get the get sick from coronavirus would be isolated from. Now, the way our put together right now anybody who has gets an isolated part of it, the rest of their family is going to be over in the quarantine no matter what we do. And so that's what we've set up. Now, fortunately, we have not had anybody come down with the virus um, at this point, anyway, that we know of. Um, what we've also done is, and we're still praying hard on that one, what we've also done is given every family stuff to ice to clean their own places, as well as a thermometer. When you stop and think about it, how many homeless people come into a shelter with a thermometer? Um, and so keeping track and keeping sources there for thermometers has been a real interesting challenge for us in this process. Those are the steps we've kind of taken. And the final step we're moving on to now is, fortunately, we've had a wonderful support. And so we've got face shields for everybody who's willing to put one on, you know, and asking them to put them on as they're going around. And one final step, if you've ever run a homeless shelter, you know that about 80% of the people who go there smoke. Um, they don't smoke in the building, but there is a place that's covered where they all smoke. And so unfortunately, you're putting mouths and hands and cigarettes in the same place as seats and other things. And so that place gets sprayed down four times a day, um, again, with a bleach solution to make sure we're killing whatever we can before it comes into the shelter. And any new ideas anybody else can think of, I would love to hear. So. Well, I just so appreciate, I mean, and, and I'm kind of awed, uh, honestly, in this moment by just the the forethought that you're bringing to that situation. I mean, I'm just, that just is very, um, I, I'm in awe of that. So thank you for the work. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, that's great. Um, how How is the virus, as far as you understand, and this is for either of you, um, impacting people without homes? Well, I can share with you that, you know, the people without homes, you know, we haven't seen it rip through the Snohomish County area anyway in there. Um, we do have now as a, as a county set aside a part of the um, Angels of the Wind Arena that's set aside for a place for a homeless person who comes down with either gets exposed or has um, has the actual virus and goes into isolation. Mm -hmm. um, they have people in there. Um, but not overwhelmingly filled with people. And it's focused on people who don't have someplace else to go to do those things. Um, so it's not, I mean, someone who's, you know, has a home and a place like that, they can go to a room and be isolated there and, and hopefully, you know, go ride out the storm of this whole thing. Um, so it's not, but it's all, everybody's kind of just waiting for it. When's it going to happen? Um, and so that's what I can say there. But the real challenge that I find is not, it's, it's more the what's not open now that would have been open for these folks. I see. Um, there's no place to go to the bathroom. There's no place to wash your hands. There's no place to go to get a meal. And if they are going to go to get a meal, I mean, the one I heard this morning, which made all the sense in the world, lots and lots and lots of, of folks who are living on the street live off of the leftovers that people dump when they get done, but they really aren't done. Well, those people aren't there anymore. So their source of food has dried up, is gone. And so they, and then the places that once did do dinners, congregate, you know, feeding programs, many of them are still in existence, but some have moved. Some have gone to a bag out the door with a hand, you know, and, and so that's changed a lot there in what's going on. And, but the other side is there's some really good stuff that's happening. Um, the county and other agencies have really stepped up and have taken a bunch of people off the street. A family that calls in to 211 right now and gets you know in there and says, I'm homeless living on the street with my family is likely to get stuck in a motel 
with a voucher tonight. Whereas I can tell you three months ago, they were likely to still be on the, on the street tonight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, an individual who is, is in, in any way, you know, older or sick or has some kind of heart disease or lung disease, that kind of stuff is almost immediately placed in a, in a motel setting and paid for by the county. And the, the money's coming from both the state and the federal government, but that's taken care of also. And so what we're finding, interestingly enough, is that there's not that many families out there right now looking for the programs new. Um, but it's still one where we still haven't found them all and we're still not taking care of them all. Wow. Wow. I'm glad to hear, Jim, some of the things that uh, I'm learning about hearing you mention some of the things that have been able to be extended um, or, or um, reached out for the county. Uh, and, and I want to echo something that you said. Um, I've, aside from people may, maybe getting sick and, and not... Uh, immediately being able to be you know, diagnosed or identified or quarantined for our, our neighbors who are on the streets. Um, uh, we've seen uh, as a faith community, the, the impact of um, sheltering in place and building closures and organization closures. Um, Jim mentioned the meals and, and services and things like that, but it's also things like <clears throat> having the library to go to, to be able to access the internet and um, you know, make connections for job searches, or uh, we even, where we are uh, on uh, East Casino Road, our building, which has been closed since the shelter in place uh, order, closed to all groups and gatherings in our building, um, you know, we've done our best to try, you know, our worship services have gone online, but we are aware of our members that, you know, some of our members that aren't, you know, internet savvy or aren't connected to the internet and our online things, and we've been you know, mailing things and making phone calls and finding other ways to connect with them. Um, but we have uh, a handful of, of people who uh, are mostly living on the street that occasionally or regularly are a part of our worshiping community. And I feel for them, you know, I don't, we don't know how to reach them. We don't know how to provide something else for them because we don't have an address to mail something to uh, and they're not able to connect with what we do online. So the isolating effects for their spiritual health is right there along with the isolating effects for their physical needs. Well, and it's one thing to be isolated, you know, and in a home that's warm and where you have resources <laughs> around you and, a book to pick up if you want to, or internet access or cable TV. It's another thing to be isolated and still be on the street. I mean, that I that I I just cannot imagine that. Um, and I and you know, of course, with the economic impact of all this, which of course you know, no one really understands. I think extremely well what that's going to be. I I kind of wonder about um, you know about. Uh, whether or not this crisis is going to lead to to more folk without homes uh, in the next year or two. Um, any thoughts on that, either of you? <laughs> I have some, some big concerns in this particular area. When I see a family come into the shelter, the most difficult family to take care of is a family who has about $10,000 worth of debt and an eviction. Now, we've done some things right now to help um, put off eviction. So they have moratoriums on evictions and we've asked the governor to make that longer. Um, but the problem is there's nothing in that process that pays the rent during that time. So at the end of this, my fear is there's going to be a bow wave of folks who are two and three months behind in their rent, owe, the, owe their landlord $10,000 and there's not a program to make up that difference anywhere. And then, you know, 20 days later, they're out on the street and we're now you know, buried under twice as many families who are now homeless. Um, that's the part that I'm concerned about in seeing what we're doing. And, and we do, as much as we've thought about the plan for getting into this, we really need now to be thinking about the plan to get out of this. What are we going to do to get out of this situation and back into a normal work flow in a, a normal work fashion. Um, what we're working on a lot with some of the organizations that I partner with is trying to make sure that we're taking care of the money that we've got now to help people stay current with their, instead of getting into behind in arrears, trying to help them with just a little help, they can stay current with what they need to do. <clears throat> and in that way, we can make sure that 
Um, I wish I could say that as soon as $1,200 drops into a family's lap, the immediate thing they think about is save it till I, next time or pay off what I just didn't pay last month. But I'm afraid that's not what happens most of the time. So that's the challenge I'm looking forward to. Well, and, and you know, that, that sort of, that whole conversation sort of shifts us into why are there so many folk in, in the Seattle area, the West Coast, um, who are experiencing a, a lack of a home right now? Like, what are some of the societal and economic factors that lead into that? Before this whole thing happened, and Luke, I'll give you a chance to talk here, I promise, you know, before this whole thing happened, I used to tell folks there are three, re three primary reasons why people are homeless right now in Seattle, Snohomish, you know, this, this, this um, area. The very first reason is the high cost of rent. If you look at what's happened with rent over the last several years, um, the rent here, not even last several years, the last year and a half, two years has gone up, you know, double digits every year. You know, and so consequently, you know, the rent for, from 2010 till now is about 65% higher than it was. And that same period of time, which is the second number one reason for, the second reason for homelessness is the low wages for people with low skills. That also connects low wages with low, pe low education. Um, those have not changed significantly. You might say that if you look at what they've raised with what we've done with the minimum wage raise, um, that's as much as what we've had, you know, happen during that time. The third reason is you and I, if we were to go out and try and find an apartment right now and try and find one this week, there's so few apartments available that there's a competition out there. And as I often used to like to say, a Boeing engineer and a, and a McDonald's worker are now competing for the same apartment. You're the landlord. Who do you go to? You know, you go to the Boeing engineer where you know he's going to get a salary, you know he can afford to pay this, he's not going to have to struggle to do this. You go that way. And so there's those three reasons. Okay, which of those three reasons was the homeless person's fault? None of them. None of them. Yeah. Now, five and six are mental health, untreated mental health and mental health issues and substance abuse. Sure. So they are there and they're present. And they often fit into the other two, three that I just talked about. But when you think about the primary reasons, you know, the, the, the homeless person wasn't responsible for any of those things. You know, so, so one of the things that really has been impacting me these last three or four years um, is thinking about what makes societies anxious. And because when we're anxious, we, we tend to otherize people. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at, at, at wages, uh, you know, with a with a, a inflation adjusted dollar, basically wages have been flat since about 1975. Correct. Right. Um, but uh, but the, the price of housing, including rentals, has it's 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 gone up and down, but it's gone up significantly. And so you and so you just can't you just cannot afford uh, you know, people cannot afford uh, a a home and. As, as the Fed put out a number of years ago now, or about a year ago, that the average 45% you know, of, of Americans can't afford a $400 emergency. Correct. And there are a lot of $400 emergencies in life. And there's even more of them right now because that $1,200 check from the government is not probably going to cover uh, much more than rent for one month for a lot of these, a lot of folk. And they're all of a sudden out of out of work, and so we have a lot of folk that are extremely stressed right now. And I'm I also have deep concerns about what happens uh, in the next six months to a year. The stress level is not this is only part of it, but it's it will. I mean, we have good people doing good things, but one of the things you saw happen when I talked earlier about how they've moved all these people into motels and that kind of stuff. This money is not different money than we had before. There's a different will to use that money in a different way. And so that's not money that wasn't there in our in our community before. It's it's that choice, and the choice is made like that because this is affecting everybody. It was easier before this happened to say that's their problem. You know, they're the ones that are homeless. They made the mistake. That's why they're there. This is not now an other problem. This is a my problem, and I'm willing now to use that money to do this. And so hopefully we can get some good out of this in the idea of recognizing that homelessness and, you know, poverty and these other things are all of our challenges. You know, they're all of our problems to work with. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think back to the, you know, to some of the language in the Christian scriptures, you know, about um, essentially blaming uh, folk that were under Roman occupation for being under Roman occupation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, and, and people blaming uh, Jesus in particular for hanging out with sinners and tax collectors and, and, and folk that, that really had been impacted by the empire's work uh, to, to uh, adjust the economics of the day uh, to benefit Romans instead of everyday people. And then, and then now what we see, you know, I see even uh, folk that I know real well, um, you know, sometimes uh, basically blaming uh, people without homes um, in a way that, that, that makes them in some ways, um, well, definitely other uh -huh. and, and a, a blamed and shamed other. I, I see that shame as people walk in the back door of the shelter carrying their belongings from their car into garbage bags. I see it all the time, you know, and it takes them a week or more to come and connect with the other people in the shelter just because they can't believe they got to this spot. Now, I also get the great love and that's a great part of my job to less than nine months, less than three months later, get to see them walk out the front door of the shelter with car keys and, and an apartment key to move into. So that's the part that's good about what we do and how we do it, you know, and that's about 80% of the folks that come into our shelter, walk out the front door, going into an apartment. And so it's really, you know, a, a positive that we do have also in this process. Um, so there are some great parts of it, but they're also what that blaming and shaming you're talking about. You know, when I look at, I'm looking right over here at my bulletin board right above, and we're the interfaith family shelter. So interfaith is a critical part of who we are and what we do. And I have sitting right up there, something called, it's a golden rule poster. And on that poster, there is every single major and some ones that I don't know anything about religion up there. And you know something, every single one of them has you know, that same ethic of the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Mm -hmm. You know, and as we look at Holy Week this week for the Christians and look at what's happening there, that's a stop that we need to say because Jesus really did for others first and foremost. But as we also look at and we see that it's Passover this week also, mm -hmm. you know, we see the same kind of work of, of, of Judaism in the idea of keeping that together. And as we prepare for the beginning of Ramadan later on in the month, you know, the same kind of idea comes right out of the Quran, you know, about how we are supposed to take care of the other among us. And so in that process, it's not you get to choose which other you get to take care of. You get to choose all the others that are out there because all of them are our neighbor. And we want to do to them as we would want done to us. Yeah, and that's always, you know, and, and Luke here, I mean, you know, I, I know that you're a, you're a pastor and you deal with this all the time. Uh, Jesus was asked this question, you know, about, well, who is my neighbor? In some kind of attempt to limit, you know, who our neighbors are, who are the worthy neighbors, uh, maybe. Um, and of course, you know, Jesus rejects that, that story by sharing a positive story about Samaritans. In other words, to say everyone is your neighbor and everyone's capable of being a good neighbor to you. Um, any, any thoughts yeah. about this whole otherization uh, piece with ho our homeless sisters and brothers? Well, I'll just jump on. You, you brought up the Good Samaritan story and that dialogue Jesus has with the, you know, expert in the law and, you know, those who... Um, you know, ask that qualifying question, well, who is my neighbor? And I've always loved the, the more overlooked part at the end of that story, where after telling this story about the outcast othered person being a good neighbor to someone in need, uh, you know, the question G Jesus turns their question of who is my neighbor around to who in the story was a neighbor. Right. And that Jesus invites, you know, all of us to be neighbors, be good neighbors to one another, mm -hmm. not waiting or looking for someone else qualifying who's my neighbor or, or not my neighbor. So that's, that's, I think, a good challenge for all of us. Um, the way that the, you know, the Samaritan in that story <clears throat> took the funds that he had to care for someone who was in a much worse spot um, you know, thinks it makes me think of, you know, other things in the gospels, like, um, you know, whoever has 
two shirts should share with the one who has none. Uh, you know, it's not a socialist idea necessarily of forced redistribution. It's that it's that question of what's the responsibility of everybody who has uh, for their brother, their sister, their neighbor. And uh, that's that's something I hope that you know we've talked about. Jim mentioned the impact or the the lack of impact for you know the the governmental relief you know funds that are going to be coming to everyone. Um, in how far will that go for people who are of lesser means? I think we also, uh, especially in our faith communities, need to ask <coughs> our community members and our neighbors who have greater need or who have greater means for whom that $1,200 or however much more they might be getting per child, um, you know, if they were, if they're, if they're folks that like me have been able to be working from home and have still had income or still had, you know, their job um, and they're not in an insecure place um, to be thinking about uh, their, their faith communities, their charities, their local organizations and nonprofits that are doing that work of caring for our fellow neighbors and helping them have the resources that they need, thinking about how much of that relief check can they pass along uh, to those organizations. Uh, I can't, I don't know, Jim, if you guys are seeing your giving affected in terms of your support from your financial partners, you know, on an individual and family basis these days, but our church, like every other church, you know, we've got our folks who, you know, give by, you know, monthly or give online, but we're, you know, right now entirely without those folks that just put something in the plate when they're physically there. And uh, we're not alone in, you know, a lot of our faith groups and other nonprofits are seeing and are going to see a huge drop in our um, financial support. And uh, it's not just to keep those organizations alive, it's to keep the good work of caring for our neighbors in need going that, uh, um, that we need to see people who have the have the second shirt be able to pass on that means to someone else uh, or to those who are helping those who don't have. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, every, every, everywhere I go, I'm talking to folk, uh, or, you know, going anywhere, but every, every conversation I have, that conversation is, is, is taking place. And I, I think uh, after, I know that several times when there've been, been some, some middle-class tax cuts, you know, there's been a, a call for people who are, um, who are doing okay uh, and receive some of these funds to think about how that money can flow uh, through other people, uh, through agencies uh, to, to go to people who have, have more need. And I, I think there'll be an opportunity to talk about that in a little bit. H how did the Interfaith Family Shelter get started, Jim? It's, a, it's an interesting story of how we started off. We started off in 1984 mm -hmm. um, as a group of Christian ministers in Snohomish County um, who got together trying to deal with the fact that there was a real problem with, and almost every one of them experience, and anybody who's been a minister or has been connected with the church knows what this is. It's a car that's sitting in the parking lot. They come up and knock on the front door of the parsonage or the front door of the church office, and you open the door up and you look out, and there's dad standing there or maybe mom standing there talking to you with three or four kids hanging out of the car out there and saying, reverend or or you know, pastor, what do I do? I, I've lost my job. I don't have money. I can't find housing. I don't have. And so it was a real issue that they were really facing in that time frame. And But each individual church felt like they didn't have the ability to do much more than I can give you $50 to get a uh, and at that point in time to get a room for the night, or I can give you $25 to drive across town to get to some place that you need to go for gas. Um, but I don't have enough and don't have a, a, a connection there. So well, they put together their, their forces and realized that with volunteers, they could put together a program. There was a, a, a building called Bethany that was being run on, on um, downtown Everett here on, on I'm trying to remember what street it was on anyway, downtown anyway, that was, was available for them to have an evening shelter for families. And what they did during that time was that for each week, a church congregation would take responsibility for being the host for the night. They would feed a dinner, 
at seven o'clock at night. They would bed people down up to five families down. There would be people that would stay overnight with the folks that were there. And then at seven o'clock the next morning, gave them a cold breakfast, kicked them out on the street, and then they could come back the next night. This was completely voluntary. So everything that was happening during this time was this week is one church, this week's the next church, this week's the next church. And this is the same point in time when we realized that other faith groups wanted to be part of this conversation. Um, and so that's when Temple Beth Or decided. They lived right next to where we were we were having this congregation, this thing happening, um, where their church is. Um, there, were, there was the LDS church that wanted to come in and be part of this, this activity that was going on. The different Baha'i groups that are here in town wanted to be part of what was going on. And so that's the point in time when this North Puget Sound Council of Churches, which was all Christian focused, um, became the interfaith you know, Association of Northwest Washington. I see. And so there was a change. This happened about 91, 92 is what happened. Sure. Um, and so it went through at that point in time, but the, the sky fell in 1999, or at least we thought it was. Um, what happened at that point in time was that Bethany, who had been running this large building on Broadway down here, yeah. sold out to Compass Health, which is now where the big Compass Health is down on Broadway. Mm. And um, they couldn't keep the shelter there. Well, lo and behold, the Catholic pastor came up to one of the meetings and said, you know, I've got this convent that's been sitting empty for 10 years. It cost me about $30,000 a year to heat and light and keep it. If you're willing to take it over and do all the maintenance on it, I'll give it to you for a dollar a year. And since 1999, the Interfaith Family Shelter has been located in the back half of, or the back three quarters of, you know, the, the, the old con Dominican convent you know, over at Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church is where it's located. And so what we have there now is 11 rooms for 11 families at a time. And so that's how it happened. Now, interestingly enough, one of the things you don't probably know, and it's interesting to note, is there's a small organization that was actually born and, and raised at the same time we were born and raised. That came out of the same group of people who were founders of this, this group of, of church leaders. Um, and it became this small group called Housing Hope. Mm -hmm. So our roots are, are the same roots as Housing Hope. In the early 90s, that's a point in time when they wanted to go much more into, you know, buying, preparing, building property for people to move into and doing it that way, less just focusing on running a shelter and right. found that it was a best for them at that point in time to split off. And so Ed Peterson, who is still, you know, my God in this work of, of housing people, um, absolutely was a, a critical part of this changeover that, that expanded to become Housing Hope. And we, as Interfaith, just kind of continued along on the side, staying exclusively in emergency shelter work for families. Always wow. focused on families, though. Yeah. Wow. So, so the, you know, so all these, these you know, and of course, I, I remember a time when, when, you know, uh, one Christian denomination hanging out with another was kind of controversial. And it's really, it's just really neat to see now that, that we, we recognize that we all share different, you know, a lot of the same values. Absolutely. And that, and that when we, sh when we work on a, on a need in the community together, we bring so much more strength and fun and vitality uh, to that process. We've had about 25 faith communities who continually regularly support us wow. throughout the time now. Um, some of them significantly in cost. And, and four years ago or three years ago, when I became executive director, I just asked the board, I said, guys, we're just running this shelter. We don't need to be interfaith. Do we need to do this anymore? And the, the great news about the conversation was, no, this is who we are. This is where we come from. And what our strength comes from is this working together, you know, across different faiths. And, 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 and in fact, I was given a, a marching orders to go out and find more ways to work with the faith groups at that time. And we've been able to do that in the next, in the next couple of years, you know, and so what's exciting to me about what we're doing right now, Luke's not here just because he's this wonderful guy who I could talk into coming and join me tonight. Um, Luke is here because he's the leader of, an, of a church that stepped up and said, you know, we were kind of asked and we were working with a group of people called Everett Faith in Action, um, which is a group of church leaders and other leaders and city leaders looking at how do we deal with homelessness. And one of the areas that we saw happening in other communities is that some other communities were finding that people who were living in their cars needed a safe place to park. 
Um, and, and what we can do if we work together with a faith group is that in fact, if we were as a nonprofit agency based loosely on a bunch of different faiths, got together with a faith group, we could team our strengths together and come up with a, a program and a, and a plan. And July 30th of 2019, um, we had our first um, families move into the Cars to Housing program at Luke's Church. Um, Luke's Church stepped forward and we spent a six month um, discernment process. And it was, it was a wonderful discernment process because it paralleled our communication with the community about our program. Um, and what we wanted to do and what we were thinking about doing. We never came in with this is what we're going to do because I was still waiting for Luke's church to make the decision to do it, you know, but in that process, what we were able to do is have dialogue with all the folks in the neighborhood, the schools in the neighborhood, the police officers, the fire department, you know, all the folks who would be the, the community, you know, association and that kind of stuff to really talk about what we're going to do. And the, the greatest line was when we sat down with the school district folks was you're only going to take five families at a time. Why? We need more than that. Um, it wasn't a case of look at the problem, you're going to bring homeless kids more to our schools in this area. No, it was we know we have these kids. Thank you for doing something to help with it. And well, frankly, wow. what, we got, going, going. what we got from the community at that point in time, I got like four or five messages. Of all those four or five messages, they were all saying, thank you for doing this. We need this in our community. Um, I know Luke got one from a guy who lives several miles away that was trying to say, why the heck are you doing this? But you know, well, and I'm, and I'm sure that in the in the process of having that conversation, <laughs> it sure took a lot of energy on your part. You surfaced. I mean, it was an opportunity to surface a lot of potential issues, mm -hmm. work through things uh, ahead of time, and actually makes the launch mm -hmm. better. Um, Luke, what was the conversation in in your own community and in your own neighborhood about that about that program? Uh, yeah, it was good. I mean, as Jim said, we we tried to take a very intentional process. Uh, as a Presbyterian congregation, our um, our way of doing things as a congregation is very process oriented and uh, you know discernment oriented. So we had you know uh, a committee working on developing um, kind of the idea of the process, along with uh, Jim and his folks at Interfaith, along with some of the other um, supporters that were from other churches that are a part of the Everett Faith in Action group. Um, you know, some of them even, you know, just talking about, you know, we don't have these ways of physically helping, but we're supporting this, we encourage this, we'll back this and then, you know, provide whatever, you know, kind of assistance and financial support. Um, so we, we just took some time to develop um, the program and learning and listening to a few others. So our, the Cars to Housing program that, that is in our parking lot, uh, you know, administered by Interfaith, uh, is the first safe parking program uh, for uh, any homeless individuals um, in the city of Everett. Uh, first in Snohomish County, period, right, Jim? There's one other down at, at, at Edmonds Unitarian Church in Ed Edmonds. So. Right. So, so there, we, we, were, we learned about the program in, uh, at Edmonds, another one at a Lutheran church uh, in um, Ballard, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, and we also we communicated with another with a church in Redmond. We we learned from a lot of different programs along the way, and then when we felt like we had the program that made the most sense for us in our in our location at this time as a as a community, uh, then we worked through a process with our congregation. I see. And when our congregation had the chance to in large group settings and then in some small group settings hear about it offer their feedback um and then our elders had you know were on it involved in it early on the 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 board of elders that would be making the ultimate decision about whether we would go forward with this yeah uh, we're very faithful in their discernment over you know those months and then uh once they were ready to make that decision i think it was kind of march ish is when we had the final decision jim i believe no you didn't give me a final answer till june you know i well, was still yeah. <laughs> you know, i mean i mean the 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 when our when our when our leaders said yes let's go forward with the yep. uh, community yep. commu uh, conversation because then it was april and may that we were doing communication in the in the neighborhood 
so we had we had a day where um uh a staff member from Interfaith and myself went door to door to all of the churches that immediately, all the, sorry, all of the neighbors, all the houses that immediately um, adjoin our property. Um, and we're, we're right across the street from Cascade high school yeah. on uh, casino road there. And then there's a street that has a whole bunch of deep, long lots that back up to the parking lot that we were going to use. So we went, door to door and uh it was probably about half and half the 25 houses that we went to people that we spoke to in person in that moment versus places where they weren't at home and we left information uh, but in all those cases we also invited neighbors to come attend uh, an informational session uh you know in the evening so we invited them into our place and let them ask their questions, take walks with them out in the space and talk with them. And all those conversations, you know, we saw, uh, we also visited with the neighborhood councils and, you know, things like that. And I would say in, in every conversation, we saw people go from guarded and anxious and, you know, my knee jerk reaction is to be not happy with this idea to, even if they weren't super excited, they could understand that this was help. This was providing an important um, asset, and and a big part of the fit for us and this timing in our city was that there's been so much in Everett that has been taking place in the last year or two, um, expanding our capacity for providing care and housing in particular for our homeless neighbors, but there was almost nothing that was expanding capacity beyond you know, beyond interfaith shelters capacity to care for homeless families. So, so we felt like the partnership with interfaith was perfect because they had the expertise to do the intake and do all of the case management work. Um, all we had to do was say, uh, we think we have space that could be used for this. Right. We have space we're not using. Um, and, and then to go through that process. And once we communicated to both the church and the neighborhood and the community that, that there already are families in their vehicles hop, popping around to different places, trying to find a safe place to sleep at night in our city, in our community, if we can provide them a place to not be on the street and to be in a safer, more stable place, the whole point is that that's where then they can work with the case manager. That's where they can have the consistent uh, help and be able to take the steps they need to take to remove the obstacles to housing for them. Um, and it's been, it's been wonderful to see the people really come in and then go out of that program uh, much even faster than we were planning for it to take place in terms of how we set, how we set up the program. Wow. So let, let's say someone comes to the to the to the um, to this safe car you know car car parking situation or to the shelter. What, what are the what, what's kind of the process? What are some of the services that you all offer, Jim, that kind of help them uh, move move toward having a home? Well, the the key thing we figured out about three or four years ago is we're really we we thought of ourselves and saw ourselves only as a place for people to give shelter. Um, so that was the focus of, and, and really in that process, you inadvertently kind of held on to people. Um, I came in and got a real message from our funders that you guys are an emergency shelter. You're only supposed to have people for 90 days. Why are they staying for 100 or, or 150 days? Or, And even, even I looked at our lease and it said it's a 90-day shelter. And I looked at our license, which comes from the, health, the state health department, and it said you're a 90-day you know, transient accommodation. So so we started talking about the 90 days much more as a staff, because what it means is that if you're talking about 90 days, you really talk about a short period of time that you've got to get people from, you know, not just zero, but in a hole, deep hole, often economically, emotionally, socially, you know, you know, health wise out of that hole and into a place where they can actually thrive. Um, and the great news in that process is, that we changed over and became a housing business. Our job in focus is really to become a housing business. So the first meeting we have with clients is a conversation. It's just a conversation, but in that conversation, you're trying to bring out what got you where you are today and where do you wanna go? 
because in that process, what you can begin to start to see is, okay, this is what are the barriers. This is what caused the problem. And sometimes we have to dig hard to get there. I mean, you, you talk and you talk and you talk, and then you get a credit report and it says something completely different, yeah. you know, and then you look at the credit report and say, okay, how do we fix this? Um, and then you find more and more. And so finally you figure out, okay, what are the barriers that we're dealing with here? How do we take those barriers away? And we know now, you know, if we want to get somebody into an apartment, which is our goal in this process, you've got to get rid of the debt. So how can we do that? Can you take all the money you make between now and the time you get out of here and put it towards this debt? Because we'll pay for your food. We'll pay for, you know, your laundry. We'll pay for all of the hygiene products you need. We'll make sure that you've got a house over your We don't charge anybody any rent for anything. Nobody has a fee to be in here ever. You know, so it puts your money all to paying off this debt. Because if we can get it down, even if we can show an, a, a landlord that you're paying it down, you've got a plan and you're working on it, they'll put you in there. Wow. Let's go to the court and see if we can't get this eviction on your record uh, expunged if it wasn't real or at least get it so it's, you know, if it never went through the whole process, we can get it so it doesn't go out immediately because a landlord, they see that eviction pops up and the first thing they say is, nope, not this one. We don't want it. And we've got somebody else that can take it. Um, I have two people who work full time who are, I would call them my landlord legend wonder workers who their whole job is to meet with, talk with, work with both landlords and our clients to get them into our rapid rehousing program. Um, this is a program we've had for the, about the last three years. We ex doubled ex its, its capacity this last year. And so we've got, I think right now, about 48 or 50 families who are in apartments that we support for up to a year after the time that they're in the shelter. So we're helping them with first and last month's rents and deposits and you know, utility fees and whatever else to get you into the apartment. And then we give you a decreasing um, subsidy over the course of a year so that the last payment comes, you're usually on your own to take care of it. Wow. Great news about that is about 94% of the families who get to that spot are still able to do it on their own. Wow. Um, so that's the challenge of, of looking at things differently. Now, at the same time, You've got substance abuse, you've got alcoholism, you've got stuff. So I have a person who works exclusively in this area. And so what she's working on is getting people connected to mental health. If you can get them into get back on their medications and get back taking care of what they need to take care of, it's amazing what they can accomplish. Yes. Um, if you can take care of and get somebody detoxed and then get them going through treatment, inpatient, outpatient, any way you can work it. You, I mean, if they stop using, it's amazing how well they can run their lives. And it's usually that it's that problem of trying to run your life under the influence or trying to run your life with a mental health problem that's untreated. And, and unfortunately, you know, about 80% of the people who, like I said earlier, go through the shelter and go out into an apartment. Unfortunately, the 20% that's left over don't. And I had to get my staff to be okay with the fact that at the end of 90 days, we have to really look at this case and say, okay, what happened here? You know, why is it these people didn't get where they need to go? And what we've seen over the last three years is that almost every one of those cases, they were unwilling or unable to deal with that mental health issue or that substance abuse issue. Yeah. Those folks that did are, are in apartments right now and are, and are being successful. I mean, they still have to have a case manager come in and check with them every month and then check with them to make sure that they're taking care of all the stuff they need to take care of. And believe it or not, landlords love that spot too. Yeah. Because, you know, if you're renting an apartment to somebody and you know that somebody's coming along with them to help them keep them accountable, it's a nice thing to have. So it's that relationship too. So those are most of the things that we do for families, as well as, 60% of our kid, our families are kids. So there's gotta be a children's program that's going on to take care of and help kids too. Wow. And it's been a real challenge this last three last month or so, and will be for the next three months now through summer um, because we've got all of our kids out. Um, but working with the school district, working with our partners, you know, we're, we're working to make sure that kids are staying up on what they need to do. So, so Luke, you know, what, what kind of ha have you seen in terms of your own faith community and in terms of, you know, participating with the Interfaith Family Shelter in this work? What kind of, what are some of the positive impacts you've seen amongst your own, your own folk there at uh, the Presbyterian Church? Well, I think, um, you know, we, 
uh, we've all, we've been a church that has cared about and, and, and done a lot of little things here and there, you know, to, to be showing our concern and care for our homeless neighbors for as long as the church has, uh, been around, which is close to 60 years. But the, you know, like many churches, at least in the season that, um, that we've been in, you know, for the last little while, uh, you know, we're a church where a lot of people, you know, give their financial support, or we've had a, a few, a couple members here or there who've gone above and beyond with a, a special outreach that they do, but all of it's been doing it somewhere else at a different location or a different place and not, you know, physically on our, on our space. And it was, it's been really neat for me to see kind of the, the, the unique kind of spiritual meaning it has for people to think that, that they are putting their own place, their own property, their own, you know, location on the line, so to speak, for doing something. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I was thinking, you know, let's, you know, early on, we were just trying to remove any barriers we could to getting this thing in place as quickly as possible. And uh, we've been so grateful for the the funding from the city of Everett that yes. has been funding this program. And, and they made it very clear early on, you know, what would be the best case scenario for having this be able to work easily, quickly, and, and successfully. Um, and it had to do with a faith based, you know, location, you know, uh, sponsoring it, uh, having an organization like Interfaith with the case management expertise. But then, uh, you know, the, the, the basic needs that we had to take care of were, you know, were mostly just based on basic, you know, health and hygiene and, and safety. Um, and, and that was the, the minimum we needed to kind of start with, uh, you know, an asphalt parking lot, a little bit of fencing and a porta potty. And that was about all we needed to get started. And I, I thought we don't need to look beyond that because that, that'll just get us in the door. We'll start something. Uh, and I'm not, I wasn't, I, I wasn't surprised at all over time to, you know, we keep having members say, well, shouldn't we do something more? Or how about we do something else? Or, you know, our committee folks, we started doing a monthly dinner meeting with, you know, the, the guests that are a part of that, along with our meeting with Interfaith. Mm -hmm. So, so it, I, I knew it would provide an opportunity for folks to reflect on what more can we do once it becomes tangible people in our place right here with us um, that we can see that we know, you know, we can see how they're being helped. Um, and then the other thing that I think is just, you know, people always these days with so much anxiety and so much bad news they people really respond to good news. And um, from the beginning, the first time I could go into the, you know, worship service with our congregation and tell them, you know, we had this many families in the program and this last week, this many families got into housing. You know, that, that's why we called it cars to housing. <laughs> the whole uh -huh. point of the program is to get the families off the street and into housing. And, and as soon as we could start, you know, talking about that, um, you know, it doesn't take much, you know, to, to kind of see that joy well up in folks as they realize this is, this is working, this is doing something. And um, so that, you know, then, then that motivates people to want to ask, well, what else can I do? What can I give? You know, who, who, sh who do I talk to? You know, uh, I remember early on a, a member coming up to me after the first time that Jim uh, and uh, his uh, case manager, Ty, were there talking in person to our congregants. And we just described one of the families that was, you know, in the program. And it was three generations, a grandma, a mother, and a, a, a young teen daughter. And, uh, you know, in tears, you know, this member comes up to me afterwards and says, you know, what can I give to provide something for this girl? I just think of this teenager that's not getting to, you know, buy cl clothes for school. School is about to start, right? You know, so it's those kinds of things that motivate people to be thinking not, you know, the not the fear reaction that so many people think of, not in my backyard, but the, the grace and the compassion reaction of, oh, what can I do? I think it was, uh, you know, Victor Frankl, among many others, you know, has said that the one thing that that we really need to live is meaning. 
you know, and, and to participate in something like this as, with, as part of a community, you know, offers, offers that. And, and, and to that point, you know, Jim, I'm just, I'm curious to know, like, what, what does doing this work mean to you? What it means to me personally, I mean, yeah. I, I've had a mission in life. I mean, most of my life I spent in education. And so my belief was my, my mission was to help kids grow as, as much as they could. And what I realized as I left education and came into this work was it's to help people grow and be as much as they can be. Take them where they are now and move them as far along as you can. And recognizing, I mean, to see that happen, and I see it much more quickly than I ever saw, you know, from year to year in school. I mean, I get a chance to meet my students in the elevator going up, you know, and yeah, but I had you 40 years ago, but yeah, but you're still one of those important people in my life, Mr. Dean. But this is what I get a chance to see some of these folks and, the, and what they've done and how proud they are to go from. I mean, just to see, I mean, when they're holding on to these apartment keys, you know, after what they've been through, that's so exciting to see happen. And so those are the things that make me and give me life. Um, it also is, I'm always after a, a new challenge. I'm always after a new way to do things. So, I mean, you look at what we're doing with Cars to Housing, um, we're doing a similar kind of thing up north in Marysville, not quite the same, but we had a church approach us and said, we have a house. This house could be used for full-term rent and we'll just rent it out to a family, or we could work together and, and make it into a place where families can grow. And so we have two families right now up at Marysville United Methodist Church in a house that's part of their property um, where we're case managing them again. They're providing the space. We're renting it for a very, very low price from them, just enough to make sure they're not losing money in the, in the deal. And in that process, we're able to help 15% more families at a given time. Um, we have not seen an expansion in the space for families in Snohomish County since 2014. Wow. You know, and so this is the two more spots that we now have available. And, and frankly, I'm on the lookout for the next faith group that's interested in looking at a partnership because what we're seeing is certainly I need to look at my staffing and see if we need some more staff to do this, but I'm willing to go out and dig and try and find. I mean, it should be a case where it's a, it's a bonus for both of us. I mean, we get the chance to use what faith groups have, which is property, which is facility and other stuff that lots of them have and they're wondering what they're doing with. Um, and then, you know, we in that process get to get the expertise together to be able to manage it in a way that gets people moving from where we don't want to be to someplace we do want to be. And, and we can involve the church group in that process. And I think it's great for both, you know, both the, the faith group as well as, and it doesn't put them in a position where they look at a project. I think if Luke looked at this project, took it to his his board and asked them to do this all on their own as volunteers on their own, they would have laughed him out of the room and he would be looking for a new place to be the pastor. <laughs> but having a partnership here, it really works out, you know, incredibly well. Well, and, and I, I think I think that's a that's one really awesome way that people could could think about participating with you all is to to approach you with with some property or with a facility that that you all might be able to partner around as 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 Luke and Luke's congregation did um, wh where could people go if they want to share some financial resources Jim oh well, that's always one that we can do um, that the easiest place for you to go and look would be to go to our website and it's really an in, in easy one to find it's interfaith wa so it's Interfaith Washington, W-A dot O-R-G. Oh. Interfaith Y. And, the, and one of the first things you'll see is donate. Now, you don't have to donate that way. You can donate, you know, in there's also th items and that kind of stuff that you can provide for people that they need, both yeah. when they come into the shelter and when they leave. But, oh. but financial donations obviously are critically important to being able to move forward with these programs. Um, because, you know, what they ask me to do in this process as the agency is come up with the money for it, too. I mean, I hope Luke has not had any any drain on his finances on his church because we've done this. You know, that's my goal is to not have him. Now, his church has given us and given us and given us donations and other stuff, but but it shouldn't be something where it was a drain on his church to do it. Right, right. So I just want to thank both of you, not just for being on this conversation tonight, but but for the work that you do, for the work your community does, for the work of your staff just for the, the the thoughtfulness and the the depth of value that you both bring to this and and I, I'm sure on behalf of everybody we're just grateful for the work that you're doing and 
And so thank you for being with us tonight. And I, I just want to remind people, we're going to have uh, some, some youth from Kids for Peace join us next week. If you want to find out more about Paths to Understanding, you can go to pathstounderstanding.org. We want you to check out uh, Challenge 2.0 hosted by Jeff Renner. Um, you can look at that on our YouTube channel at Paths to Understanding at, at, uh, on YouTube. And also Sunday mornings at 7.30 on MeTV. Um, we're also running a Facts Over Fear campaign uh, in which we're countering anti-Muslim bigotry through a bunch of memes and through some animated video. So you can go check that out at factsoverfear.org. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Luke. Thank you.